This video is going to take you through controlling microbial growth, which is chapter five in the next uh, Nestor textbook. First thing that I talk about here is again the person who's kind of more important when it comes to the control of microbial growth, and that's Joseph Lister. Uh, he was a doctor, and one of the things that he believed was that if you kept your OR cleaner and you kept your instruments cleaner and you washed hands between patients, you tended to see fewer infections develop in those patients, and so. Back in his time, the disinfectant that they used for these things was carbolic acid, which is actually very, very toxic. But I suppose it beats a bacterial infection that's going to make you lose a limb because you end up with gas gangrene or something along those lines. And so he would sterilize his instruments with carbolic acid. And then if a wound looked like it was getting bad, he would also use it on the wound itself, which I'm sure would be very painful. Um, one of the things that people usually mention when they hear his name is it automatically triggers a connection to Listerine. He did not invent Listerine. He is not tied to Listerine. In fact, the history of Listerine was that it was a floor cleaner that then got marketed as an oral cleaner and now it's used as a antiseptic mouthwash, essentially. But this is Lister with his glorious mutton chops telling people to keep it clean back in the day. Um, nowadays, if you go into an operating room, it's a sterile field. The instruments are all sterilized prior to use. They're put onto a sterile wrap. If you turn your back on them, they're not considered sterile anymore, and you have to get entirely new instruments. And we do all of this work that, trust me, is very tedious so that we can prevent infections. This person has a MRSA infection in a wound. Uh, you can see a little bit of the seepage that's going on right there. So. Either this person didn't keep it clean afterwards, or maybe one of the instruments got contaminated, or maybe the wound just didn't get cleaned very well. There's lots of ways that infection can happen, but he was one of the first people that was trying to prevent this type of thing from happening during surgery and just general medical procedures that happened. So um, I'll just kind of skip past that one. Um, the ways that we can control microbial growth are subdivided into two categories based on whether they're physical methods or whether they're chemical methods. We're going to be starting with the physical methods. Um, physical methods include something as simple as washing your hands. This is why washing your hands is one of the best ways to prevent infection because you rubbing your hands together and the water hitting your hands drag some of the microbes off of your hands and then flushes them down a drain. So that's a physical method that can help control microbial growth. Um, heat, and yes, fire is a, an example, an extreme example of heat. That can kill bacteria, although do remember different bacterial species have different temperature requirements. But generally speaking, if you light them on fire, you're pretty much going to kill anything. Uh, UV radiation and um, ionizing radiation. Radiation is a physical method. That's not a chemical thing. A lot of people get miscon uh, have misconceptions about that. But UV light is a physical method that damages DNA in organisms. And then there's just basic filtration can also help. You can filter water. You can filter air through HEPA filters. And so all of these are physical methods that can help control or slow the growth of bacteria. Next. Chemical methods, we're going to have a whole table full of a whole bunch of different chemicals, but right now it's very difficult to find these two things on shelves and stores because of the COVID outbreak that's happening. Both of these are chemical methods that can kill viruses and can kill bacteria for that matter. And again, we'll talk about other examples. We've got like alcohols and aldehydes and biguanides, and there's a whole slew of them, but these are just two that it's very difficult to find right now, so I wanted to throw those up there for you guys. Mm. All right, after that, you guys just have a whole slew of definitions, and each one of these definitions is very specific to essentially how clean something actually is. When we say that something is sterile, we mean that there is nothing living on it. There are no endospores, there's no cysts, there's no viruses, there's no vegetative cells. However, there can still be prions contaminating during sterile because most sterilization procedures don't actually damage prions. And so that's something to keep in mind. So sterilization is the process that creates a sterile object, whether it's a scalpel used during surgery or it's an IV fluid that we're going to be injecting into people. One of the traditional ways that we sterilize is with an autoclave. The one that we have in lab doesn't have this rotary device for locking, but it still looks fairly similar. What an autoclave does is it takes the temperature very high and the pressure very high, and both of those two things together sterilize objects that are inside of that autoclave. Hmm. Okay. Disinfection just means that you have reduced the number of organisms that is present on something. I forgot that I had a question in here. So one of the things that you do have to keep in mind is different objects have different degrees of cleanliness that they have to be. So if you're working in a hospital, do the eating instruments actually have to be sterile? 
And the answer is no, they don't have to be. You're, be, you're going to be putting it into your mouth and your mouth should have closed mucous membranes on it. So they should be clean, definitely. But sterility would be an overkill in that case. And so you don't have to sterilize silverware. Um, if a person is severely immunocompromised, maybe at that point. But honestly, I don't think even hospitals where they do have clean rooms sterilize the silverware, although I could be wrong about that. Um, would this, which is a scalpel, have to be sterile? And this seems like it's a really simple question, but it depends on what you're using it for. C is actually the right answer for this. So in AMP or Freshman Bio, you guys dissected stuff. If you're cutting open a dead frog or a dead pig or a dead, dead rat, does it have to be sterile? No, because you're not going to give a dead cat an infection that's going to cause a problem. It just needed to be clean and sharp so that you could do your dissection without risk for injury. However, if you're using this on a living person to do a surgery, then absolutely this has to be sterile. So don't automatically assume that you know what the use for something is, because most people don't think about those dissections when they start to see instruments that go like this. All right, so I already defined this one earlier, but you can pause the video to get your definitions for this. Disinfectants are going to be chemicals that you use to carry out the act of disinfection. Um, this is one that, again, is fairly difficult to find. Um, I usually buy it on Amazon because it's easier. You usually buy it to clean, like, laundry. You mix it in with your laundry to disinfect your laundry should you need to. Like, maybe somebody in your family had the flu and you really wanted to clean their stuff out. You mix that in there. We also use it to clean the countertops because it's a little bit more thorough of a cleaner it leaves a residue behind so it keeps killing even after you have stopped using that. Um, this little gif over here is showing you the process of pasteurization which yes Louis Pasteur is the guy who came up with that. This disinfects various things that are sold um, like milk and apple juice and things like that. You can pasteurize them to disinfect them. Um, next up you have defined germicides and bactericidal. So a germicide is essentially just a strong disinfectant. Um, they're going to specifically be tar targeting vegetative microorganisms and then viruses. And they will usually, especially if they are EPA registered, they will tell you what they can kill on the back so that you know, like, is it good to use against COVID-19 or will it not kill COVID-19, which most germicides are going to be killing COVID-19 as an example. Bactericidal means that it kills vegetative bacteria. So just, so just remember, homicide is you kill a person. Bactericide is you kill bacteria. Um, Antiseptics are kind of like germicides, except these can be applied to the skin. So what you're seeing here is iodine that's being applied to a wound. Um, this is sometimes called betadine or povidone iodine, but iodine is an antiseptic. So is alcohol and hydrogen peroxide because you can use that on the skin. One of the things that um, really scared me about some of the stuff that Donald Trump said during this COVID outbreak was maybe we should start using disinfectants in the body so people don't get viruses. Many disinfectants are toxic to you as well. For example, if you read Lysol um, or a Clorox wipe, it tells you don't use this to clean your hands because those chemicals aren't safe for you. Antiseptics are specifically safe to be used on the skin to control the growth of bacteria on the skin. Uh, pasteurization is usually how we prevent food spoilage. Um, usually this is used in reference to liquids, but you can do it with solids, it's just a little bit more difficult to do. But in this case we're showing milk. Milk is a pasteurized product unless you get raw milk, which I don't recommend as an aside. But the milk passes through some tubes that are heated, and it passes through really quickly because we don't want to boil the milk. We just want to heat it enough to kill most of the organisms in the milk. We're not sterilizing it. We're just removing most of the organism, so that helps to prevent infection from drinking stuff like raw milk, which you can catch some fairly nasty diseases from raw milk. Um, this also helps to make the item last longer on a shelf, so it increases shelf life as well. Uh, decontamination. This is something that you see happen if there's like a chemical spill or a radiation in uh, incident or... If you guys remember back in 2001 when 9-11 happened, there was also a person who mailed anthrax to Congress um, and to various people in the media. That person incidentally was never caught, although we think we know who it was. Um, he's dead now, so it's not like we can do anything about it. But anyway, uh, we had to decontaminate people that worked at the post office that had handled those letters and the members of Congress and the building itself had to be decontaminated, uh, decontaminated as well. And so this is like a decontamination shower where they scrub a person off to reduce the number of organisms that are on there so that they're less likely to get sick because of that exposure. Um, you can also decontaminate, uh, like, 
Bluebell several years ago had a problem where they had listeria in their plant and you couldn't buy Bluebell for a while. Well, they had to decontaminate their facility to remove all the listeria from their facility. So it just means that you clean something well enough that you're removing the pathogens from the area or the person. Um, sanitization doesn't really have a strict definition. Essentially, it just means you clean something. And so when you see that something's been sanitized, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to reduce the risk of infection. It just means that something has been cleaned. And then preservation is a, something that just helps prevent food spoilage. Um, like they will wash apples and then store them for a very long time, incidentally, in facilities. They wash romaine lettuce, although it's very difficult to get into the core of romaine lettuce, but those are things that help preserve those foods. Um, so earlier I mentioned bactericidal. Bacterostatic is kind of similar. What it means is you inhibit the growth of the organism. It doesn't actually kill them though. Bacterostatic though, by preventing the growth of that organism, you prevent it in a lot of cases from actually making a person sick because they're, they can't reproduce themselves and so they can't actually start an infection. Um, some of our antibiotics that we talk about in later chapters can also be classified as bactericidal and bacterostatic. So we're gonna see those words pop up again. What are some things that can be done in daily life to control microbial growth? Okay, so I chose this picture for a reason. It was a, kind of a, an homage to my grandmother. My grandmother was one of those old school cooks. She had that nice old wooden butcher block cutting board that she would use. And so I'm showing you this picture because this is what my grandmother looked like as she was cooking. And then she would have like a dish rag thrown over her shoulder that she would use for everything, like wiping down the chicken and then drying her hands after she washed her hands. So as we look at this picture, What's wrong with this picture? Um, first off, you should not use wooden cutting boards when you're cutting meats, and that's because your knife leaves grooves in the wood, and it's practically impossible to clean the groove in the woods, and so you can't ever clean that cutting board enough to prevent contamination of other objects. Second, based on the arrangement of this stuff, it looks like she's cutting the chicken, and then she's gonna cut these vegetables off on the side. That means that all the salmonella that was on this chicken or turkey, it's actually bigger than a chicken, that's probably a turkey, but anyway, um, it's gonna get onto these things as they cut those, and if they don't get cooked like they were gonna use this for a salad, it's almost a guaranteed food poisoning incident at that point. Um, if they use the same knife, same thing for that, they shouldn't do that. Now going back to the dish rag, if grandma used the towel to like dry off the chicken or the turkey, and then she dried her hands with it, well she just rubbed all the salmonella from the turkey onto her hands, and so now her hands are dirty and everything that she touches is going to get contaminated with what she handled. So it's kind of about good food safety in your daily life is a big part of what this is. Um, washing not just your hands, but you should wash your hands periodically during the day, but it's also scrub the knife down, probably do the vegetables first, wash the knife, and then do the meat afterwards, or have a completely separate knife and cutting board for meats and then vegetables. Um, properly cooking the foods, this again comes back, my parents are horrible cooks, at least my mother is. Um, sorry mom, anyway. <laughs> Uh, she would occasionally serve us chicken that was uh, pink in the middle, so think like beef that was rare but chicken. That's not okay. Chicken very often is contaminated with a whole bunch of different bacteria, and so chicken needs to be well done every single time you do the chicken. Otherwise, you're running that risk of salmonella um, getting into your family and causing vomiting and diarrhea, and so you got to properly cook all of those foods and make sure they hit the appropriate temperature. We also mentioned in uh, the eukaryotes lab that you can catch stuff like trichinella by not cooking your pork effectively. And so not just microorganisms like bacteria, but you can also catch worms from things like that. Um, cleaning your surfaces, I kind of hit on that a little bit earlier, but every now and then disinfect your countertops just to make them nice and clean. And then refrigerating food. I had a friend that would just keep their leftovers on the counter and come back and eat them five hours later. If you remember anything about generation time in the last chapter, if you leave E. coli to grow in food over five hours, that's a lot of cells that's gonna be in that food after that five hours. And imagine you left it there for two days. That's disgusting. There's gonna be so many bacteria in there that you are, pardon me, guaranteed to get sick if you were to leave that there. Um, let's see, what is the single most important thing that you can do to prevent the spread of infection? Wash your hands. Um, that's one of the things that we have seen with this COVID infection is a lot of people didn't know how to wash their hands correctly. And 
I can't tell you how many studies have been done about this, but I remember one that was very funny. So there's a conference of epidemiologists. Those are doctors who study infectious disease. They hired a couple of grad students to kind of stand around in the bathroom and observe these epidemiologists who are doctors that study disease to see whether or not they washed their hands after they went to the bathroom. And the vast majority of their doctors didn't do that. Um, if you go into any clinical setting, your doctor should wash their hands when they come into the room and you should see them wash their hands so that you know they're not spreading infection from their last patient to you. And yet, if you think back to all of your doctor's appointments, how many of your doctors actually do that like they're supposed to? Same for nurses. They're supposed to wash their hands between every single patient. Do you think they're really doing that? Probably not. It gets really tiresome really fast, and yet it is the most important thing that you can do to prevent the spread of infection. All right. What are some of the factors that make healthcare-associated infections so deadly? Um, and then I tell you that while the book doesn't use this term in this chapter, it does later on, so I wanted to go ahead and give you the term no nosocomial infection. Nosocomial means that the person got it while they were being cared for in the medical industry. Usually it means that it's a hospital acquired infection, but it could also mean a clinic, and fire, uh, clinic infection, acquired infection, sorry. Um, so the reasons that you need are up here, but basically if there's a person going to a hospital, they already have a health problem. That means their immune system is already working overtime or their immune system has been wiped out as they've been treated for cancer or they were immunosuppressed already or they had an autoimmune disease or whatever. So they're just more susceptible because they were already sick when they went in there. Second, a lot of people going into hospitals, they're having surgery, they're getting IVs. That means their surface barriers have been breached and your surface barriers are that first defense of the immune system and they are really good at keeping bacteria and other microbes out of your body. But the second you breach them, they can't be an effective barrier anymore. And so you're providing a site for bacteria to move into the body. Um, and so that's the second one. And then number three, again, because all the people there are more than likely sick or they've got something going on, it's just more likely that there are pathogens present in the hospital. So there's lots of reasons why people get sick when they go to hospitals. These are just the few that I'm going to mention for you. All right. We've really already discussed aseptic technique in both lab and lecture before, but just remember it's everything that you have to do to make sure you're not contaminating any samples. Um, this is you flame your loop before you try to transfer anything. Your glassware gets sterilized before and after use. Um, we sterilize everything before we throw it away to make sure we're not putting a bunch of organisms into the landfill. It's all of that sort of jazz that we have been talking about. Uh, what are some of the things that can be done to food to ensure that food's not contaminated? We already talked about heat it to the appropriate temperature, cook your food appropriately. One of the things that gets done prior to you getting it is that a lot of your foods are irradiated. Um, a lot of your containers are irradiated as well and that helps to kill any microbes that are on the surface of your food. Um, and they do usually just do the surface. They don't want to hit it with radiation that penetrates so they're just cleaning bacteria off the surface of something when they irradiate it. Um, using chemical additives, that's for food that is sold like prepackaged, like think frozen dinners or Chef Boyardee or something like that. They have to put chemicals into that food to prevent bacteria from growing inside of that can because remember there's a lot of bacteria that can grow anaerobically inside of a can. And then just making sure that they're keeping all of their instruments clean and you're keeping all of your instruments clean as you're prepping that food. Um, what's happen happening right near here is, I know these look kind of like they're green apples, but these are green tomatoes that are being washed in a chlorinated bath. So the chlorine helps to reduce microbial contamination on the surface of the tomato so that they last longer. Almost all of our produce gets rinsed this way, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't wash your produce when you get it home. Um, in fact, it's a good idea, especially for things like berries that tend to go bad really fast, it's a good idea to wash them right after you buy them before you put them up. That will actually help them stay fresher for longer once you put them into the refrigerator. How is water treated to remove pathogens? So one of the main things that a water treatment plant does is it adds chlorine. Chlorine is a halogen, kind of like iodine is a halogen, and it kills things that are in that water. However, not all microorganisms respond to chlorine. Um, what this is a picture of, a blurry picture of, is Cryptosporidium parvum. Um, specifically, those big pink sort of spheres are cysts of crypto. And cysts are kind of like the protist equivalent of an endospore. It's a dormant stage that's very tough to kill, and chlorine does not kill cryptosporidium. 
and there are periodically outbreaks of that in area pools and when that happens don't go to the pool um, but they usually have to close the pools for a while and dump even more chlorine in there and then do additional filtration methods to try to get the crypto out of the pool. Uh, what are disinfection byproducts? Well, anytime you have chemicals that you're adding into the water, water is not a pure just H2O. There's a bunch of stuff mixed in there. And so some of the chemicals that are in the water naturally will react with the chemicals that you're using as a disinfectant. And so you'll get disinfection byproducts as a result of those natural reactions. Some disinfection byproducts are bad for human health. And so it is required that um, when they do water quality testing and then they send out the piece of paper telling you what's going on with your water in your town, assuming you don't have well water, they have to put what level of disinfection byproducts are in the water after it's left the treatment plant. And if it gets to be too high, you're not allowed to drink that water because it means there's too many bad chemicals that are in there. Um, let's see. Does chlorine always work is, I guess, a question that you have. There we go. Yeah, it's the second half of the what are the disinfection byproducts. Um, I did mention this earlier, but again, no, there are some organisms that chlorine not only doesn't kill, but they can grow in chlorinated substances, and I'll talk about that later. Um, then I usually just like to talk about this picture for just a second. I know it's kind of blurry. To me, one of the most horrible inventions of the last 50 years are those swim diapers that you can put on babies that can't control their bowel or their bladder. Um, this kid has pooped in said swim bladder and is now sliding down a slide at a water park trailing a nice little trail of poo behind on the slide. If your kid cannot control their bowels, they should not be in public swimming pools because think of all the bacteria and in, in this case it could be crypto. Um, that is in that and now the poor pool employees have to dump extra chlorine in there that is not great for their lungs incidentally and it turns into this whole nightmare where they have to close the pool they we should just not have swim diapers they shouldn't exist your kids should not be in pools if they will do things like this in said pool okay uh, what are some microbes that are highly resistant to control and how can they be controlled another way to ask that is what are some species or things that are tough to kill Number one, bacterial endospores. We have talked about these before. They're heat resistant, they're chemical resistant, they're acid resistant, they're resistant to drought, they're resistant to a whole bunch of things. So if you want to kill an endospore, you have to hit them not only with high heat or super high concentrated chemicals, you tend to also have to hit them with something else on top of that. Like in terms of the heat, you have to hit them with heat and pressure at the same time. And again, the chemical just has to be super duper toxic. Protozoan cysts, just as difficult to kill. Um, you can boil them, but you have to boil them for a while. They tend to have these additional layers outside of them, so chemicals tend to not work on protozoan cysts, but extreme heat can kill them. Um, mycobacterium, remember those are the species that cause like tuberculosis and leprosy. Uh, they're the acid fast organisms that we talked about earlier. So they're resistant to traditional disinfectants, but you can just use more concentrated disinfectants to still kill them. Uh, Pseudomonas, that's a genus of organisms. The one that we work with in lab is Pseudomonas arginosa. It is also resistant to disinfectants and in fact it can grow in bleach and so sometimes the hospital will use a disinfectant that's been sitting on a shelf and not know Pseudomonas has been growing in it and then there'll be an outbreak of Pseudomonas at that facility because instead of disinfecting they were smearing Pseudomonas all over everything. Uh, they can usually use some different chemicals to kill Pseudomonas though. We haven't talked a lot about viruses just yet, but viruses can be naked or they can be enveloped. Naked viruses just have a protein coat. Um, enveloped viruses are, uh, they have a lipid membrane and then a protein coat, so they have a couple of additional layers. However, these are actually easier to kill because that lipid envelope is a lot more sensitive to different chemicals. Um, so naked viruses, the ones with just a protein coat, they're harder to kill. You have to use, it's such a strong class of disinfectant that it's not called a disinfectant anymore. It's called a sterilant. It's just a very strong chemical that you use to kill naked viruses. Just as an aside, coronavirus is an enveloped virus. So one of the wonderful things about it is it's actually easier to kill coronavirus. All you have to do is disinfect with just basic bleach or disinfection like Clorox wipes or Lysol wipes. They'll kill COVID. All right, what can be done to remove organisms from an object in order to minimize the time necessary to sterilize or disinfectant? Wash it first. If you do that, you're removing a lot of the organism anyway by using one of those physical methods, so just clean something first. 
Um, should we dispose of the contents before we sterilize or after? One of the things that I mentioned earlier is we sterilize things before we dispose of them so that we're not introducing a big load of bacteria into the trash and then sending it off to the dump. We don't want to make people who work in that industry sicker. Um, how does temperature tend to influence microbial death rates? As a general rule, the hotter you make it, the more death you will get. However, remember different species of bacteria have different growth requirements. So usually when we talk about this though, we're talking about pathogens. Pathogens are mesophiles, so they like it right around human body temperature. If you heat it up more than that, first, they stop reproducing. Second, they can start to die off. And so as a general rule, heat kills them, but you have to make it fairly hot in order to do that. How does pH influence microbial death rate? Well, remember there's neutrophiles, there's acidophiles, and there's alkalophiles. Everything has its own specific pH that they want to grow in. But take them too far outside of that range, make the pH more extreme one way or the other, and that tends to increase death rate. Um, so there's a reason I'm showing you this picture. Um, just as a, I know y'all can't answer me, but as an aside, what's the pH of lemon juice? Is it uh, neutral, acidic, or basic? It is acidic, and it's actually a fairly strong acid. I don't know if you guys have ever done it, but if you take lemon juice and you squirt it onto meat, like say as a marinade, or you squirt it onto fish, um, the lemon juice is actually a strong enough acid that it will denature the proteins and make it look like you've already cooked your chicken or your fish or whatever you were marinating in that. Um, that also does slow down microbial growth, and so it's a good way to do that as well. Okay. Next step, you have what are some of the instruments that belong in each category and how clean does each instrument need to be? And we're starting with critical instruments. Critical instruments are instruments that are going to be breaching your surface barriers. And so in this case, I'm showing you a hypodermic needle. We have breached the epidermis. We are down in where the blood vessels are. So we have breached the surface barriers. That means hypodermic needles are critical instruments. Since we are breaching the surface barriers and getting in near the bloodstream, these must be sterile. Remember, sterile means free of all vegetative cells, all endospores, and all viruses. So these are, they must be the cleanest out of everything. Uh, so like I said, this applies to anything that breaches the barriers. Scalpels are in here. Um, any of the scopes like arthroscopes, endoscopes, if they're breaching a barrier in order to get someplace, like if you're doing a laparoscopic procedure, those have to be sterile. Um, if you're just doing an endoscope down to the GI tract, that's different though. It depends on whether or not we're breaching that barrier, on whether or not something's going to be critical. Okay, semi-critical. This is going to touch your intact mucous membranes. So remember your mucous membranes line any body cavity that's open to the exterior. This would be like the mouth, the vagina, the anus, the nose. Um, these are supposed to be seriously disinfected, so free of all vegetative cells and viruses. However, there can be endospores still present on them. Um, now, I mentioned endoscopes a second ago. We could argue about endoscopes in terms of whether or not they're supposed to be critical or semi-critical. An endoscope is a device that you either send down through the mouth so that you can view the pharynx, the esophagus, sometimes down into the stomach, or you can send it up the bone to do something like a colonoscopy. If you are going up in there, you don't know if the mucous membrane is intact or not. Maybe the person has an ulcer. Maybe they have a chemical burn because of something that they swallowed. Maybe they have worms that are causing perforations in the intestinal mucosa. There's a bunch of different factors that are at play there. And if we have a breached barrier, it should be critical. So I am of the opinion that if you're going to be sticking a camera anywhere up in me, or down in me, it should be sterile. However, most hospitals don't view it that way and they just disinfect them in between patients. Um, I have a friend who works as an epidemiologist and she has worked at a facility where their endoscope was being disinfected, but only disinfected, not sterilized. And that hospital ended up contaminating several people with C. diff, which is um, a bacterial infection that I think we talked about in an earlier chapter as a model organism. It's that one where we can treat it with a fecal transplant. That's another reason why I feel like they should be critical, but they're not. They are classified as semi-critical, at least according to your textbook. Um, anything else that's going in, like if you're doing rectal thermometers, they just have to be disinfected. They don't have to be sterilized because, again, it's supposed to be an intact mucous membrane. All right, non-critical instruments. These are just touching intact skin, so they should be clean. Um, these are things that 
honestly don't get cleaned as often as they're supposed to. Like you really should be cleaning your stethoscope diaphragm in between each patient. And yet I've never witnessed a nurse clean. Well, no, I take that back. I have seen a couple of them do it, but most of the time they don't. Um, tables, they don't really clean them. They just strip more paper over them. Um, and then they assume everything is nice and clean from that point. But they really should do a little bit of a better job cleaning those because people can have wounds or they can have a microorganism on there that might cause infection in the next person and so they should be really clean. Okay. Does the composition of an item make a difference when you're considering how to disinfect it? Absolutely. Um, I mentioned earlier that um, we tend to use autoclaves to disinfect things. Well, autoclaves get very hot and they increase the pressure. If you were to put plastic in there, you'd melt it. And I would know I have melted a lot of test tube wax over my years at Hill College. Um, if you're going to be trying to disinfect something that's plastic, you tend to have to use sterilants instead. So those chemicals that are strong enough that they're going to kill all the organisms that are on that rack. Um, so just basically, yes. Uh, next up, you're in that first table that is explaining the physical methods of control. So everything in this first table is a physical method of control. First few are going to be about heat. Boiling is, of course, a wet heat. Um, you will every now and then hear that there is a boil water notice in certain places. That means that the city has contaminated their water supply somehow. So you boil the water to kill any microbes that are in that water and then it is safe to drink at that point. Um, generally speaking, you should boil it for at least five minutes to kill any organisms that are in there. Pasteurization we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, I mentioned that we usually use it for liquids because it's easier to pasteurize a liquid, but here in this case we're actually pasteurizing almonds in this facility. Um, they're still just exposing it to heat to kill any organisms that are on the surface so that we can preserve shelf life. Autoclave is what we use in lab. Again, this is the one that gets up to really high temperatures and it increases the pressure to kill any organisms that are inside of there. Um, there are usually indicators to let you know that everything that was in there did actually get sterilized. Like we have to verify that it's working appropriately. Otherwise we have to bring in a service person to come in and fix our autoclave because it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, this is kind of what I'm talking about here. There's autoclave tape. And if the autoclave is working correctly, you'll get these little bars that develop on it during the autoclave process. If the tape doesn't develop those lines, it means we didn't hit the temperature or the pressure that we were supposed to. And so everything that's in here is not actually sterile because we didn't get those stripes like we were supposed to. Um, this is a phenol red test. And essentially what happens is we sterilize the broth and then we bring it out and then we bend the tube a little bit. And and then there was some little microorganisms inside this inner tube that's in there. And when you break it, it releases the bacteria in. And if you get a color change, it means your organism was still alive. So your autoclave did not work appropriately. Um, incineration. Essentially, this means you burned it up. So you fired it somehow. You had a Bunsen burner. You had a crematorium. Uh, the back incinerators that we use in lab, that's an incineration process. Hmm. Filtration. You can filter water and you can filter air. What this does is this holds the bacteria back, but it allows the water or the air to pass through, so it reduces the number of microbes that are circulating in the fluid or in the air. Um, this is what a HEPA filter can look like. The fume hoods that they use in labs um, that are that have fume hoods is, I guess, how I'll say that. Um, those usually have HEPA filters in them so that it can keep the air clean within the fume hood, but it does kind of depend on the manufacturer of the fume hood, whether or not it's actually going to have that. Um, then we get our two different kinds of radiation. Ionizing radiation penetrates cells and the human body for that matter. And as it penetrates tissues, it leaves behind this trail of ions and those ions are gonna destroy DNA. Um, because it can penetrate, what we can do is like, we can package up band-aids and then hit the band-aids with radiation and it sterilizes the bandage inside the packaging so that you know your band-aid is sterile before you put it on. And so this is really good for sterilizing things after you have packaged it. Um, UV radiation, on the other hand, still damages DNA like ionizing radiation, but it doesn't penetrate. It's only good for doing things on the surface. Now, you heard about UV radiation in your freshman bio or your AMP class because we talk about it when we talk about skin cancers. This is the kind of radiation that the sun emits. It does ionizing too for that matter, but this is what gets through our atmosphere and it increases our chance of developing skin cancer like this person's melanoma. Um, they actually sell little handheld, de uh, handheld devices that emit UV light so that you can clean 
um, you know, whatever your germaphobic body needs to clean. So keyboards, um, public use pins, whatever, stuff like that. But you can use UV radiation to disinfect surfaces of things. Which method do we use to sterilize our lab glassware? The autoclave. Um, the table that we just filled in, incidentally, is pretty much what I wanted here, like table 5.1 from your book is kind of what I wanted in your notes, although I didn't talk about each of these in a lot of detail. I just combined filtration, um, but there you go. Uh, which method do we use for our inoculating loops in lab? That would be incineration with the back decinerator. Um, oh, this is what our autoclave in lab looks like. Um, you might have bumped into that handle at some point over time. Be careful of the handle. Um, but this is what gets up to high pressure and high temps so that we can sterilize our glassware, our media, and anything else that we put in there. Um, I already said incineration for the inoculating use. Define the following groups of germicides and explain what each might be used for. Um, this picture shows you how each of these chemicals can kill bacterial cells. So some of them are going to work on the plasma membrane of the bacterium. If you damage the membrane, the cell's going to rupture or lyse. Some of them interact with proteins present in the cell. They denature those proteins. And remember, if you denature a protein, you break it and it doesn't do its job anymore. And then some of them are going to interact with the DNA, causing mutations or just damaging it enough that we can't carry out transcription and translation anymore. And so this is how those chemicals are actually going to work in a cell. Uh, to start you out, we've got sterilins. Sterilins destroy all microbes, including viruses and endospores, and so they do have to be able to carry out sterilization. We're going to be using these on things that you can't put into an autoclave to actually sterilize critical instruments like scalpels or things like that, if like a scalpel had a plastic handle. Um, High-level disinfectants are the next level down. They still kill viruses and vegetative cells, but they don't have to kill endospores anymore. We usually use these for semi-critical uh, instruments. This is one brand of a high-level disinfectant that can be used. It's usually sold to hospitals. I I've never seen it for sale over the counter in our area. Um, the next two things are very often the same chemical. It's just different concentrations of those different chemicals. Um, and these are used just to clean your basic non-critical instruments and sometimes floors, depending on what they're using there. But intermediate is going to kill most of the viruses and vegetative bacteria on there. And then low level, it's just going to kill most of your vegetative bacteria and just the envelope viruses, not the naked ones. And so these are the ones that you would be more likely to find that are for sale for you to clean your house up. Mm -hmm. Um, some of the factors that hospitals, clinics, and labs have to consider when they're choosing which chemical they want to use is, first off, how toxic is it? Do you want to use something that's a really good sterilant but might make your employees sick or might increase the cost because you have to provide additional PPE as they use those different chemicals to try to sterilize instruments? Again, going back to Lister, the carbolic acid he used was very toxic. But it was one of the first things that did get used, and so it's still an important step that got us to where we are today in terms of cleaning different instruments. Um, activity and presence of organic matter. So if there's organic matter present, that means there's a lot of chemicals, especially organic compounds that are present. Is that organic compound going to interact with the chemicals that are in your disinfectants? That is something that has to be considered. And so phenolics tend to work better when there is organic matter present. Um, compatibility with the material being treated. We're going to talk a little bit, there's one gas that we're going to talk about that you can use to clean electrical stuff because most of the other chemicals are going to be liquid and you really shouldn't be applying liquids that can conduct electricity to electrical equipment and so you have to think about things like that as you're sterilizing different instruments. Um, does it leave a residue behind? Sometimes you want a residue, like as we clean our countertops, um, in lab, that residue helps keep the growth of bacteria down even between separate labs, but we don't want a residue on a floor because that might make the floor more slippery um, or more sticky and cause more trips. So there's different issues that you have to consider for different places in a lab. Um, how much does it cost is fairly obvious, and then how easy is it to find? Like right now, it's practically impossible to find most disinfectants because of the COVID issue that we're, we've got going on. Uh, storage and stability. Bleach does not maintain its viability for very long, so you can't go buy like a year's worth of bleach because by the end of the year it's not going to be very effective anymore. Hydrogen peroxide also has a fairly short shelf life, but alcohol tends to last a lot longer, so you choose the chemical and you buy it as often as you need to to make sure that it stays good and effective. 
And then last, environmental risk. Are you using a chemical to clean your floors that have a drain in them where that chemical is going to go down the drain and then interfere and kill all the bacteria in the wastewater treatment plant so that that plant is no longer cleaning water like it's supposed to? That is something that they have to consider as well. All right. I'm just going to kind of skip past that one. Here's the chemical table. It's table 5.2 in this chapter. You can use that to get anything else that you wanted in there. And we're about to try to recreate that table. Okay. For your alcohols. So your examples for alcohol that are used as disinfectants are ethanol and isopropanol, or isopropyl alcohol is another thing it's called. That's your basic alcohol that you can buy in the first aid section at any pharmacy type of thing. For your characteristics that you need, it is usually really cheap. Right now, a lot of these disinfectants have become more expensive because of COVID, but alcohol is still fairly cheap. Um, it does evaporate very quickly. One of the things that's important about disinfectants is you have to leave them on for enough time that they actually kill everything that's there. And if your alcohol evaporates off too quickly, you might not have killed everything because it left the area due to evaporation. Um, for uses, this one is both a disinfectant, you can clean glassware with it, and it's an antiseptic, you can clean yourself with it or clean a wound with it as well. Um, aldehydes. The only one that you guys would have heard of probably is formaldehyde that used to be used as a preservative for stuff like our dead cats and pigs and whatnot for lab, but there's a bunch of other aldehydes that are out here. Um, if you've ever smelled formaldehyde, it's unpleasant. It can irritate the respiratory system and it tends to make your eyes water when you're near it. And so it's a fairly toxic one and it's not one that you can use as an antiseptic, but it does still get used as in tiny, tiny amounts as preservatives in vaccines so that your vaccines don't spoil. And we can use it to sterilize medical instruments that are heat sensitive. Uh, Biguanides. The example that I'm gonna give you for this is chlorhexidine. Chlorhexidine is the primary ingredient in Hibiclens, which is used as a surgical scrub. You can also buy it over the counter in the first aid section to clean wounds that you have so that they don't get infected. Um, they do make chlorhexidine impregnated medical instruments, or in this case, this is a chip. So for a person who has really severe periodontal disease, they'll slip that chip up into the gums and it slowly releases the chlorhexidine to reduce the bacterial infection that the person had going on to reduce the tooth decay. And then sometimes some of our instruments that uh, were bandages, they can impregnate those with chlorhexidine to reduce infection and things that have to stay in a person for a while. Ethylene oxide. This is our one that is a gas and it does require a special chamber because you have to fill the chamber with gas and then it cleans anything that is in there. Um, the gas is carcinogenic, it is highly flammable slash explosive, so you only use it usually in very specific places, but it does get used to sterilize things that do need gas to sterilize them. Halogens, so for those of you that remember your chemistry, halogens are everything in group 7. That should be an F, I don't know why it says DO, but fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, those are all halogens. They tend to have fairly high electronegativity, so they work at stealing electrons from other things, and in the process, they can mess with the chemicals in organisms, so they can be used to disinfect, and they're used as an antiseptic. Remember that iodine that they were wiping on a person's wound earlier? That is a halogen off down there. Um, I already mentioned Pseudomonas can grow in bleach. It can also grow in iodine, so again, sh um, short storage time because Pseudomonas can grow in there. Um, I don't know why I'm showing you that. That's Pseudomonas, that's iodine, I guess just to kind of reiterate the point from a second ago. Uh, metals. The only metal that is still used as a disinfectant is silver. We used to use mercurochrome, uh, which had mercury in it, but that's, as it turns out, super toxic, so we don't do that one anymore. Um, silver can be impregnated into bandages. Um, for people who have severe burns over a lot of their body, they have special bandages that have silver on them so that the silver helps to reduce microbial growth on the burn. Um, there are also some antibacterial eye drops that we will often give to babies right after birth and they'll have silver in them. Uh, peroxygens, the only one that you guys would have heard of is hydrogen peroxide. This can be a disinfectant or an antiseptic. Um, refresher from a previous chapter, remember that anything that is catalase positive can break down hydrogen peroxide, and so you wouldn't want to use this to kill something that's catalase positive, um, but it is a pretty good wound cleaner. Phenolic compounds. Triclosan used to be put in pretty much every single product that was marketed as antibacterial. The problem with that is it does behave like a hormone in the body, so it should not have been. 
Hexachlorophene is one that is in some of those stronger Lysol disinfectants that I talked about a little bit earlier. Um, and so that can be in there. That carbolic acid that Lister used, it was a phenolic compound as well. Um, this one does work in the presence of organic contaminants. So again, you can use it on a bloody floor to clean up the bloody floor. This does leave a residue, so keep that in mind. You're going to want to rinse it off if you're putting it on a floor, but it's good for tables. Um, triclosan had been in personal care products. It's being removed. It's still possible to find it in some products, but it's getting more difficult to find that. And the hexachlorophene can cause neurological damage, so it's not usually sold except to hospitals and places that would need a stronger chemical. Um, what are some of the chemical preservatives that can be used in food? So we've got the list of stuff that is up here. There's also nitrates and nitrites which get, which get used in meats, especially deli meats. Um, that can prevent those meats from allowing botulinum to grow and form spores on there. Um, incidentally, nitrates are known carcinogens, and so that's one reason why you should not eat lunch meats all the time. It increases your risk of developing colon cancer. I um, already said that one, but there's what I said. Uh, how does low temperature storage help make food last longer? It just slows the growth of bacteria. Remember, it does not kill bacteria. It prevents them from reproducing as fast so that it keeps the food edible for a longer period of time. How does excess sugar and salt make food last longer? Well, this goes back to tonicity. If you have a lot of sugar or salt that creates a hypertonic environment, that's going to suck all the cytoplasm out of the bacterial cell and cause plasmolysis and then that kills the organism. So that's why beef jerky doesn't have to be refrigerated or a brined ham can just sit on a counter for several weeks and be just fine. It's because anything that lands on it's gonna have its water sucked out and die. Uh, the model organisms for this chapter, I chose them because they are very common food contaminants. Listeria monocytogenes is the one that caused the bluebell problem a couple of years ago. Um, what is the gram reaction of this organism? It's gram positive. What disease does it cause? Well, it has its own name. It's listeriosis. Um, how is the bacteria usually acquired? You usually get it from food that wasn't pasteurized or disinfected appropriately. I mentioned earlier that raw milk is a very dangerous thing to drink, and this is one of the reasons why you can get listeriosis. Now, listeriosis, your symptoms for that are usually like a food poisoning thing, di uh, vomiting, diarrhea. However, it can progress to meningitis, and if a pregnant woman gets it, it can cause a miscarriage. And so it's a very dangerous thing to get, um, although most people will just have fairly mild symptoms. Will adding salt to the environment kill this organism? No, they're slightly halophilic, so they like a little bit of salt. Um, so there's, up in the Pacific Northwest, kind of like we do beef jerky down here, they smoke their fish, and then their fish is kind of like a fish jerky for the rest of the year. Listeria can grow on that because even with the high salt concentration, it doesn't kill listeria. And so they'll sometimes have outbreaks of listeria with their smoked fish. Uh, will refrigeration stop the growth of the species? No, it actually likes it colder. That's why Bluebell had a problem with it. Mm. Next, Campylobacter jejuni. What is the gram reaction of this organism? It's gram negative. Uh, would this species be present in food prep surfaces? No, this one is actually, um, it doesn't like oxygen, it's anaerobic, and so it doesn't survive on surfaces where oxygen is available for very long. However, if you get like prepackaged chicken that is vacuum packed, that's a low oxygen environment and this is more likely to be present on there. Um, how can the species be controlled? Drying, heating, freezing, you can use disinfectants, you can do acidic conditions, you can pasteurize stuff. Basically, you can do a whole bunch of things. However, you have to be vigilant about trying to keep your areas clean to prevent this from contaminating anything that has been vacuum packed, essentially. Um, now, one of the good ways to study your disinfectants that are in here are flashcards. And usually when I do face-to-face -face classes, I have people make flashcards so that they can study those things. Since we're not meeting as often, instead what I decided to do is give you guys access to a Quizlet, a person made a, a Quizlet deck that was from this chapter right here. This is not my deck incidentally, so I'm not saying that it only includes information that I'm giving you. But the assignment for this chapter is to do the Quizlet deck memory challenge thing that I have posted and then upload proof that you completed the challenge. Um, an additional incentive for you guys is if you can beat my score on that Quizlet challenge, you'll get five points of extra credit on this assignment. 
So that should get you all the material that's going to be on the first test. If you have any questions about anything, please feel free to email me or talk to me about it um, before or after lab.